Good evening. Uh, finally, <laughs> it's hard to move a, a group from one side of the Maudlin Center to the other side, uh, but it's worth the trip, I, I guarantee you. I'm Richard Waller, Executive Director of the University Museums at the University of Richmond. Thank you for joining us this evening for the lecture and reception for our exhibition, Fritz Asher Expressionist, in the Joel and Lila Harnett Museum of Art. Fritz Asher belongs to Germany's lost generation, artists whose careers were interrupted or destroyed by the Nazi terror regime, and whose works remain underrecognized. The exhibition is the first American retrospective of Asher's bold and colorful works, and features early academic studies and figural compositions, as well as his late mystical landscapes devoid of human presence. We are delighted to be bringing this incredible exhibition to Richmond. Organized by the Fritz Asher Society for Persecuted, Ostracized, and Banned Art, the exhibition was curated by Rachel Stern, director and CEO of the Fritz, Fritz Asher Society. The exhibition is co-sponsored by Alliance Partners. In addition, the exhibition and related programs are made possible in part with funds from the Lewis S. Booth Arts Fund. We give a special thank you to Alliance Partners for their sponsorship and support of this important exhibition. I would like to introduce Peter Lefkin, the Senior Vice President, Government and External Affairs of Alliance of America Corporation, who would like to say a few words. Uh, we are the world's large, the second largest insurance company. We're the fifth largest asset manager. We're the largest financial services company in Germany. But we also have a significant footprint in the United States. We have about 8,000 employees and about five or six companies. Um, and here in Richmond, we have Allianz Worldwide Partners, which is about 1,000 employees, taking over one of the old Circuit City buildings, and many of you are familiar with it, and hopefully many of you are buying our products as well. Uh, its management team and its CEO, Mike Nelson, are here with us tonight, and I thank them for their support uh, for this exhibit. Allianz is very proud to be a sponsor of the Fritz Asher exhibit at the Hartnett Museum. Um, and on this most really beautiful campus, I've never been here before, but it really exceeded expectations. You're going to hear much about Fritz Asher, his work, the inspiration people draw from him inspiration, how the Third Reich and his uh, the terrible legacy of living as a Jewish person in, in Munich sort of helped define or at least altered his art after World War II. You're going to hear that from Rachel Stern, who is the executive director of the Fritz Asher Society and is also um, the curator of this event. Why is Allianz involved? I'll tell you, this is a, it's an interesting story and, and companies have to sort of acknowledge all their greatness and some of the blemishes on their records. We're a 125-year-old company. And like every other company in Germany during that period of existence, we were impacted by the Third Reich. We lived through it. And we saw the firsthand the destruction that it created and the terror that it inflicted on its Jewish population. Reich decrees started almost from the beginning. They were sort of incremental. It was sort of the, the frog in the pot type of scenario. You, you know, people will lose their jobs, lose their professional qualifications lose their businesses, lose their trades, strip away their rights just one by one by one, and ultimately leading, of course, to the most awful things, expulsion and extermination. In 1990, Allianz had done its own history, celebrating its 100th anniversary of the company. And like many corporate histories, you know, you, you sort of gloss over certain things, and we glossed over the Third Reich, and for many of us and many of its employees, and frankly, even our senior executives, we realized we needed to have that redressed immediately. Uh, we have to sort of acknowledge what was going on during that period of time and not gloss it over. And we instituted and commissioned a study by Professor Gerald Feldman, University of California, Berkeley, who did a, did a history of Allianz, the insurance industry in Third Reich, and it's a remarkably readable document. It doesn't go into all the actuarial tables, of course, but it does tell pretty much the history of Allianz and also of the insurance industry and business in general in the Third Reich, how you got caught into this web of dealing with the devil. 
Uh, in Allianz, we saw, you know, how do we, sometimes we resist it, more often than not, we just acquiesce. Right decrees can demanding that we fire employees, the firing or terminating our distribution partners, or seizing policy, or, have, or cooperating because, you know, perhaps it was a gun to their head, but nonetheless, basically seizing accounts of Jewish policyholders uh, to give to the right. All those were part of the history as a terrible legacy. And we thought, frankly, from a company like ours, we need to learn from this. We also have responsibility to redress the past and to ensure that it never happens again in the future. Through her own work and dedication, Rachel Stern has brought Fitch Astro back to life. And she's doing that particularly right now in the United States. She's gaining a certain amount of noteworthiness in Germany, but in the United States, uh, Rachel's work is remarkable. And she's not only bringing remarkable art, but she's also bringing a remarkable life story that bears iteration. We at Allianz are, are honored to have all of you here with us tonight. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge the work and the support from my very close friend, the head of the Allianz Foundation, Reverend Christopher Worthley. Uh, for, for his efforts. Without Christopher's efforts and without him sort of pay, pay, paying personal attention and making this a personal matter of personal conviction, we probably would not be here tonight. We've had many distinguished guests in here, and I don't know, I've saw, uh, I'd like to add Karen Haas, who is the district director for Congresswoman Spanberg, who was here earlier, so I'm not sure if she's here tonight. There she is, Karen, you're sticking around for the lecture, that's great. And I thank Karen, and we thank Congressman Spamberger, who has done just a remarkable job and has visited our company. And we commend everything that they're doing to try to make America a better place. And we also uh, are, are honored by having the cultural minister from Germany, uh, Ms. Vera Buten, uh, who's going to start talk from the German embassy's perspective and talk to you about Fritz Asher, what it means to the German embassy what the cultural experience can be, and she's going to give a very brief talk. And following that, I'm going to introduce to you our most honored guest, who is the Lieutenant Governor of the state of Virginia, or the Commonwealth of Virginia, I'm sorry, I come from Washington, D.C., Justin Fairfax. Uh, it's going to be a very special evening. I am truly looking forward to Rachel's uh, lecture. I have really been waiting for this for a very long period of time. But before we get to that, I'm going to ask Vera to come on up, and then we're going to ask the Lieutenant Governor to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for this kind of introduction. Um, dear Lieutenant Governor, dear Rachel Stern, honored guests and supporters of the Fritz Asser Society for Prosecuted, Ostracized, and Banned Art, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the invitation to join in the special opening of a very important exhibition. It's wonderful to be out here, out of Washington, to be here in this wonderful state capital of Richmond. It was my first time. I was really happy to, to have this opportunity to come here today. On behalf of Ambassador Emily Haber and all my colleagues at the German Embassy, Embassy in Washington, congratulations to all of those involved in bringing this exhibition to Richmond. In fact, tonight's opening represents the continuation of our engagement with the Fritz Asher, Asher, Asher Society and this exhibition in particular. Because one year ago, it was shown in New York as a part of the Year of German-American Friendship 2018-2019. Maybe you're not familiar with it, but it was maybe more known under, by the slogan Wunderbar Together. Um, in this year of German-American friendship, we had over 2,000 events in all 50 states and we partnered with more than 400 partners all over the US. We were really happy and we're, we were really proud of that. And we built this network and we're just happy to build on this network and continue this cooperation. That's why I'm so happy to be here. Um, through Wunderbar Together, we focused on the many shared aspects of experience between German and American societies on the many ways connected across the Atlantic. The Fritz Ascher Society's thematic focus fits perfectly into this initiative. And while Wunderbar Together has now officially concluded, we're pleased to continue examining these issues through the present exhibition. There are a number of reasons we feel the Fritz Asher Society's exhibition is important. Allow me to share just a few with you. First, 
from an art historical, historical perspective, the exhibition returns a key German artist of the 20th century who might otherwise have been little known to the canon. This act itself has great significance. Because our attitude towards the past, how we examine, how we understand and commemorate history, informs our mode of action in the present. By choosing to focus on a previously neglected and persecuted artist, we make a statement about our values regarding persecution of artists and human rights more broadly in the present. As a German Jew, Fritz Ascher's biography is inextricably, this is a very difficult English word, I beg your pardon, inextricably tied. <laughs> <laughs> to the horrors of National Socialism. I mean, this is actually not a place where you should laugh because they, they were really horrors. Um, and the deprivations of World War II. Though miraculously surviving these horrors, Usher's artistic output was undoubtedly shaped by them. This is the second reason why I feel this exhibition devoted to Fritz Ascher matters, especially now. It seems to me that now in Germany, and maybe also in the US, the topic of education about the Nazi past, about the Holocaust, is still important and maybe even more important than ever. By examining the artworks in the exhibition and thinking about them in the context of the biography of Fritz Ascher, visitors, young and not so young, questions surrounding, confront questions surrounding the persecution of artists. First, in the context of the Third Reich, but also through history to the present day. They may leave with ideas regarding the essential role of artistic practice in overcoming or dealing with trauma. Though Fritz Ascher faced unimaginable hardships, his creative drive helped him to sustain through life. This is one more reason we wish to support the Fritz Ascher Society's exhibition as a kind of monument to the creative spirit shared by humanity. Thank you again to Rachel Stern, the Fritsch Asser Society, the University of Richmond, Allianz, and all supporters of this exhibition. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vera, for a very inspiring talk. I now have the great honor to introduce to you today the Lieutenant Governor for the Commonwealth of Virginia, Justin Fairfax. Actually, when I looked at his biography, the only one thing that bothered me that he was born while I was in my second year in law school. That really sort of hurts, but <laughs> that's, that's another matter. But anyways, he's had a very distinguished career uh, uh, where he has he had, uh, attended uh, Duke, Duke, Univer uh, Duke University and received his legal degree uh, from Columbia. Uh, he has worked for Senator Warner. Uh, uh, he has worked for Senator Kane, I believe. And he's worked for the Senate, Senate Judiciary Committee. He's really dedicated himself to the public service, and I really commend him for sort of doing so, because sometimes it's hard to take some sacrifice, particularly for a guy there who has two young kids, and I'm sure sometimes you're here tonight, I mean, you should, you should be home pretty soon. I hope you told your wife to be home by now. I know how that, that, that can be for, for any, anybody, particularly for somebody who's is running in public office, which is a very, very difficult job. And he also worked for two years as a federal prosecutor in Alexandria, Virginia. So he sort of knows all sides of the legal equation. I, I commend uh, Lieutenant Governor Fairfax for many things, but one of which is his interest in jobs and apprentice programs. And I, this is probably putting my German uh, company hat on. This is a very, something that Germany truly has excelled in. A lot of German companies have been coming to the United States, sort of helping the U.S. government and state governments sort of involving themselves. What do we do? What do they do right in Germany? What can be transported here? Not everybody is meant for university education. We're going to take advantage of it. And how can we bring forth, you know, good, hardworking, middle-class citizens into the workforce who might otherwise be left behind? And I commend the lieutenant governor particularly for his efforts in that direction. 
With that, I'm going to ask the Lieutenant Governor to come up and say a few words. And um, after that, of course, we'll be followed by Rachel, Rachel Stern. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it is wonderful to be here with you tonight. Uh, Peter, Richard, Vera, Rachel, thank you all so much for your leadership. Uh, thank you to Allianz and Mike. I uh, met you and saw you a little bit earlier. Thank you all for sponsoring this. And to the University of Richmond, uh, what a great institution and a jewel here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, and for me, in serving as Lieutenant Governor of Virginia, we are now uh, in our 60-day legislative session. And so it's actually a special treat for me to get to leave the Capitol uh, and to come out for something uh, as wonderful as this, to look at the art of a, a great artist uh, of our time and someone who challenges uh, our thoughts about contemporary society, uh, ask the existential questions uh, about who we are and who we can aspire to be, uh, that takes an unvarnished look uh, at some of the things that happen in our societies. And uh, even today, uh, we are faced with so many uh, of those similar challenges uh, about people who are being persecuted uh, and excluded, uh, things that uh, really speak to the heart and soul of who we might be in our own humanity uh, and how we expand the scope of opportunity for others and treat each other with dignity uh, and with grace. Uh, and so I appreciate every single one of you for coming uh, out tonight. Uh, I commend to you the work of this great artist. And Rachel, thank you for helping to bring that to life for so many people. Uh, including people like me who were born in 1979, as you mentioned, and uh, have now gotten to appreciate the work of this great artist that predated uh, myself. Uh, but I just want to share with you very briefly uh, something that uh, I think art really helps us all to, to deal with. And, and in public life, as you mentioned, it can often be challenging, can be difficult. We live in uh, challenging times, but I often find myself being inspired uh, in the midst of those challenges. Uh, inspired to try to bring some light into the political darkness, something that I think that Fritz Asher also was able to do. Uh, and even despite uh, some of the division that we see, despite the fact that we often have a politics that, that uh, focuses on tearing people and communities down, we, I think when we are at our best, when we rise to the better angels of our nature, uh, we really can be a society and a world and a beloved community uh, on this birthday uh, anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King that aspires to build people and communities up. Uh, and I think art has a special and unique role uh, in that process. I often think about uh, art and artists uh, in many ways being like trees and plants. Uh, they often take things that are harmful in our society, that are emitted into our society, carbon dioxide, uh, those things that uh, really we would not want to have an abundance in our atmosphere, uh, but that they take those and they convert those uh, through their processes, through their brilliance. And Rachel and I were talking about uh, some of the processes that artists use to bring that unique gift and that brilliance to the world. And they convert things that often uh, are harmful and they make them into something good. They make us see them differently. They make us appreciate things differently. They pump the oxygen of opportunity and of understanding and of grace back into a society when those things were meant for evil, they instead made them and turned them around for good. Uh, and I think that to me is to what I take away from tonight. And, and Rachel, I look forward to the brilliance of your delivery. Uh, and just one quick, uh, very quick example and story uh, of something that was maybe meant not for good, but turned around uh, for our good uh, that I've experienced in my own life. Uh, you all know that uh, my name, my last name is Fairfax, uh, just like the county in Virginia. Uh, it's actually where we live as well, so it's easy to find my way home uh, in, in Northern Virginia. Uh, but a lot of people asked me growing up, uh, how did you and your family get the last name Fairfax? Is there some connection to Virginia? Uh, and I actually did not know. I was uh, raised in Washington, D.C. Uh, but I learned uh, how I and my family got the last name Fairfax during the week of my inauguration uh, as Lieutenant Governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia because it was discovered that week uh, in the old Fairfax County Courthouse uh, a deed of manumission, a deed of freedom uh, that had freed my great, great, great grandfather, Simon Fairfax, from slavery in Fairfax County, Virginia on June the 5th, 1798. He was freed more than 60 years before the Civil War 
by a man named Thomas Fairfax, who was the ninth Lord Fairfax from the United Kingdom, for whom Fairfax County and city are named. And so my father got a copy of that document two days before our inauguration. Uh, he gave a copy of it to me, and I saw it for the very first time in my life, 20 minutes before I walked out the steps of the Capitol on Inauguration Day to take the oath of office as the 41st Lieutenant Governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia. So I had a copy of that document in my breast pocket as I raised my right hand and took that oath. And in that moment, I learned for the very first time how I and my family got the last name Fairfax, what our connection was to the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, and to the history of this great land. And so 220 years later, Simon Fairfax's great, great, great grandson was being sworn in as the number two in command of the very same state where he had been enslaved. And what I like to say, and particularly on this day, Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday, he would have been 91 today, uh, is that as he has said so famously and so eloquently, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it ultimately bends toward justice. And I think that is something that this extraordinary artist and this extraordinary uh, exhibit uh, is going to allow people to remember and to put into their spirits that while today may be dark, while we may have challenges, while there may be things that prevent us from getting to the truth and light and hope and uplift, uh, it ultimately will turn around if we, in fact, are the ones who helped bend the arc of that moral universe. And so I thank you all for what you're doing to bring light into the darkness, to convert uh, that CO2 into the oxygen of opportunity, understanding, hope, and grace. Uh, and I appreciate every single one of you. I'm honored to represent you as the 41st Lieutenant Governor of Virginia. And I look forward to us all supporting each other and rising together. So God bless you all. Thank you for having me tonight. Well, that was, that was wonderful. Uh, I know we're running a little late in our schedule, but we'll, we'll have Rachel talk a little faster. <laughs> uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce Rachel Stern, who will talk with us this evening about the life and art of Fritz Asher. Uh, as has been mentioned, Rachel Stern is the director and CEO of the Fritz Asher Society for Persecuted, Ostracized, and Banned Art. Uh, located in New York. Her book, The Expressionist Fritz Asher, was co-edited with Ori Z. Soltis and published by Wienan Press in 2016. Uh, the exhibition catalog is available in the museum. It's a, it's a terrific publication. Uh, please take a look at it. Raised in Germany and educated at George August University of Göttingen, and I know I massacred that, too. Uh, she immigrated to the United States in 1994. Uh, Rachel worked for many years as an independent writer and curator in the Department of Prints and Drawings at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Rachel is a recipient of a 2002 NEA grant and the 2017 Hans and Leah Grundig Prize. Uh, I would like to briefly mention, Rachel will also give an exhibition walkthrough tomorrow afternoon, starting at 1.30, and I hope you will join us then for her, her gallery talk as we walk through the exhibition. I would also like to mention a panel discussion in conjunction with the exhibition. The program will take place Wednesday, February 12th from 6 to 8 p.m. here in Camp Concert Hall. I hope you'll put this on your calendars. Titled Expressionisms, Germany and the United States, the panel will be moderated by Sarah Eckhart, Associate Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art at the VMFA. And there will be four panelists, and I'd like to run through what they're going to talk about because it's so fascinating. Uh, it includes Eckhart Gillen speaking on German and American Expressionism, Manifestations of National Identity and the Break of Civilization. Karen Wilkin will speak on the Collective Unconscious, New York Expressionism. Elizabeth Berkowitz will talk on Fritz Asher 
and ideological color in modern art. And Ori Z. Soltis will speak on expressionism and spirituality. It will surely be an interesting panel discussion and will add tremendously to our understanding of the art of Fritz Asher. I hope you will be able to join us. The, the program is not included in our newsletter that just came out because uh, we've still been organizing it. Uh, but we have a flyer at the museum's front desk uh, to remind you and there will be more information on our website as, as the, de the panel is uh, developed. As always, I would like to extend special thanks to the staff of the University of Richmond Museums. They have done a stellar job, including working with faculty and other university staff in bringing this important exhibition and its related programs to our campus community and to the greater Richmond community. Thank you for making this happen so smoothly and beautifully. The title of Rachel's talk this evening is Forgotten But Not Lost, the German Expressionist Fritz Asher, as it says on the, on the wall here. Following her talk, uh, please join us in the Harnett Museum of Art to see the exhibition and to enjoy the reception in the booth lobby. Please join me in welcoming Rachel Stern. Thank you, Richard. I thank the whole team here at the Hanet Museum for their professionalism, creativity, and calm in all aspects of the exhibition preparations. Richard Waller and Elizabeth Schlatter, Matthew Howell, Heather Camper, and Martha Wright, as well as Katrina Clark, Stephen Duggins, Henley Guild, and David Hershey. I thank Allianz Partners for co-sponsoring the exhibition and I thank Peter Lefkin and Christopher Worthley, Carol Gentry, and Jack Zemp for their support. Good evening. You are all a lost generation, Gertrude Stein said to Ernest Hemingway, who used the term in the epigraph of his 1926 novel, The Sun Also Rises. It became internationally known to include those born between 1883 and 1900, who came of age during World War I, fearing violent death, and followed by great confusion and aimlessness among the war's survivors. Hemingway later wrote to his editor, Max Perkins, that the point of the book was not so much about a generation being lost, but his belief that the characters in his novel may have been bettered, but were not lost. The artist Fritz Ascher belonged to that generation. He was born on October 17, 1893 in Berlin to Jewish parents Hugo and Minna Luise Ascher, followed in 1894 and 1897 by his sisters Charlotte and Margarete. In 1899, Hugo Ascher formally left the Jewish faith with his three children who were baptized in 1901. In 1918 and 1920, both Fritz's sisters were married to non-Jews. This wedding photo was taken on the occasion of Charlotte's 1918 wedding, showing the entire Ascher family, including 25-year-old Fritz, who can be seen in the background on the right. Hugo Ascher died soon after both daughters were married in 1922. Hugo Ascher was a dentist educated in the US at University of Pennsylvania School of Dental Medicine, where he learned progressive prosthetic dental techniques. He partnered with a chemist, developed Usher's artificial enamel, and became a successful businessman. Early on, he supported his son's desire to pursue a career in the arts. Fritz Ascher had left school at, at the age of 16 and, promoted by the prominent artist Max Liebermann, attended the Progressive Art Academy in Königsberg 
and the Berlin private schools of Lovis Cohen, Adolf Meyer, and Kurt Akte. Asha was very social, well-liked, and mingled with artists such as the older Edward Munch, Emil Nolde, and Vasily Kandinsky, and his contemporaries Max Beckmann, George Rouault, Max Pechstein, and Ludwig Meitner. During a longer stay in Munich, he befriended the artist of the Simplicissimus ma magazine. Humorous sketches emerge, which often resemble caricatures, like the brash woman in Kiss Rejected, or the one adoring the artist in Rembrandt. In other sketches and drawings, he captured Berlin society and the zeitgeist critically. The beginning of World War I in 1914 seems to have focused the 21-year-old on himself. While many of his contemporaries went to battle with near-religious feelings for the fatherland, Asher's artworks reveal battle with his religious identity and suggest his inner strife. He now found his very own pictorial language in which he combined expressive strokes and intense colors with descriptive outlines and a flat application of paint. In his drawings, Asha continued to observe the Berlin society. Semitic and Aryan prototypes confront each other and reflect on the intensifying political and social polarization in German society. Jews were increasingly seen as the other, as a race different and different and separate from Germans. The male portrait in red from circa 1915 could be the comfortable, mean, satis self-satisfied, and hypocritical Herr Wendriner, the famous literary creation of German-Jewish writer Kurt Tucholsky, who incarnated the obvious dolt of all faith and races. As the First World War dragged on, with millions of casualties on all sides, chauvinism turned inward and the gulf between Germans and Jews deepened. Fritz Ascher now create, created his most important early works, highly idiosyncratic pictorial interpretations of mystical and religious content, to which he offers us his very own highly unusual takes. Gogotha from 1915 is a crucifixion scene that very much differs from the pictorial tradition. Here, the crosses with Jesus and the thieves don't occupy the center of the canvas, but instead are crowded along the upper edge of the picture before a background with an intensely yellow sun. The actual theme of the painting, however, is the spectators who rush at the viewer in chaotic panic, fleeing from a mounted soldier armed with a spear, who might depict Longinus. In the undated painting Golgotha and Pageant, the artist combined, not inconsistent with the tradition of merging past and present, the sacred scene of Gol on Golgotha with three other elements. A Roman Catholic procession led by an image of Christ, a pagan procession with a kneeling priestess, and a clown figure dressed in pink on the right, who seems to communicate with a bearded figure on the lower left. Is he intended to make a wide comment regarding religion as mass entertainment or theater? Golem from 1916 refers to the medieval Jewish legend of Judah Löw, a famous rabbi from Prague who fashioned a figure out of clay and brought it to life by inserting a piece of parchment with God's secret name written on it into the figure's mouth. According to the legend, the golem was brought to life to protect the Prague Jewish community, which was threatened by violent pogroms. In Asher's painting, the golem towers over three people, most probably Rabbi Löw, flanked by his two assistants. Their faces are strikingly formed with beards, large noses, swollen lips, and missing teeth. They are gazing to the lower left with eyes wide open in fear. Whatever they see, 
The golem is unmoved and stoically gazes straight at us. His expression speaks of the innocent of the unconscious creature, which is determined to execute the purpose it was created for, saving the community from harm, no matter the consequence. Burial from 1919 depicts a conflict in, within the Jewish community. On the right, a crowd of people is gathered in front of a round hole that suggests an urn burial. The people standing behind the grave, the person standing behind the grave appears to be giving a eulogy. Lightly sketched crosses in the background confirm the location as a Christian cemetery. In the left foreground, a man raises his hand to his head in terror or grief, gazing at the crowd. His head, coat, and side locks identify him as a religious Eastern European Jew. We might see him here shocked and pained by the Christian burial of a fellow Jew, possibly a family member. Since the 1880s, Eastern European Jews were coming to Berlin in large numbers, fleeing pogroms and massacres. The assimilated German Jews were embarrassed by the Eastern Jews' poverty and traditional looks, which seemed to confirm prevailing stereotypes. In addition to works based in religion, myth, and allegories, Usher also chose themes from literature and the world of sport, music, theater, and opera. Throughout his life, he depicted the clown who makes others laugh while crying inwardly. He drew soccer players and boxers, a new sport in Germany which quickly gained popularity in the 1920s. His two men boxing go at each other with muscular bodies and determined expressions. Until today, we can feel the animal brutality and existential drama of their encounter. In 1918, World War I was over with the utter defeat of Germany. Five million Germans dead, two million orphans, one million invalids, one million widows. The war had materially impoverished and morally confounded millions. The existential panic it left corrupted ethical standards, eroded manners, convulsed culture, and further polarized society. Dramatic of upheavals between revolutionary and reactionary forces followed nearly everywhere. Usher drew the street fights in Berlin. After the founding of the Weimar Republic, and despite its political and social instability, Berlin became a city unlike any other in Europe at the time, where the cultural avant-garde thrived as never before and as nowhere else and Jewish intellectuals and creative professionals were among the leading figures in many areas. In Usher's work, depictions of divine judgment and hell become more frequent. Naked bodies writhe, often with faces contorted by pain. He might refer here, like in other drawings of that time, to August Strindberg's Inferno, where he describes the condition of the earth, I quote, Cold and gloom, plague and hunger ravage the people. Love is transformed to deadly hate and childlike obeisance to parasite. People think they already are in hell. Quote end. Titled by the artist, the monumental pain painting The Tortured, portrays a central blue nude figure with red-orange hair. He is bound with rope and restrained by other, four other nude figures, two men and two women. It seems that the central figure is subjected to external forces. His muscular build and determined expression, however, point towards restraints beyond the physical, which might be psychological or internal. One possible interpretation views the inner struggle of the central figure as a quest to realize his ideal spiritual potential amidst conflicting forces. On January 30, 1933, Adolf Hitler was elected Reichkanzler. 
Immediately after the Reichsermächtigungsgesetz, the Enabling Act, was signed by Reichspräsident von Hindenburg in March of 1933, Hitler and the NSDAP assumed absolute power. Police and Gestapo fiercely persecuted, tortured, and killed the opponents of the regime, using lists that had been prepared long before. Among them were many artists and intellectuals. Usher feared to be a target and disappeared among friends and acquaintances, first in Berlin and later in Potsdam, constantly changing his residence. During the following month, Germany became a full-fledged dictatorship with SA, Gestapo, and the newly created SS ruling the streets. Jewish-owned shops were boycotted, new laws were created, which allowed Jews to be expelled from government positions, schools, research institutes, and universities. They were banned from practicing law and excluded from all national societies. In May, soon after the dissolution of all opposing parties, some 50,000 books by Jews and other so-called traitors and degenerates were burned in Berlin and in every other German university town. On September 22, 1933, the Reichskulturkammer, Kammer, Reich Chamber of Culture, was established to ensure that all forms of artistic creation reflected the Nazi viewpoint. Members had to prove Aryan descent and meet the reliability and aptitude standards. Jewish-born Fritz Ascher was denied membership, and from then on, he was not allowed to produce, exhibit, or sell his art. At that time, about 525,000 people, or less than 1% of the German population, were registered as Jews. A third lived in Berlin, where they made up close to 4% of the population. New laws progressively excluded Jews from professional life, endangering their livelihood. At the same time, they were excommunicated, subjected to infer the inferior status by laws like the Nuremberg Laws from 1935, and relegated to a perpetual state of dishonor. Gradually, but relentlessly, friends, neighbors, clients, and employers turned away from Jews, placing them beyond the pale of German social life and empathy. Fritz Ascher's sisters, who were married to non-Jews, lived in so-called privileged mixed marriages. Both survived the regi Nazi regime protected by their husbands. Their mother, who had illegally lived with her daughter Grete, died on October 17, 1938 her only son's birthday, and three weeks before the November pogroms. Earlier, she had asked the fr her friend Martha Grassmann to look after her son. The whole Grassmann family got involved in doing so. At work, husband Robert had heard about the planned pogroms and tried to warn Usher. But it was too late. Fritz Ascher had already been arrested and interned in the concentration camp Sachsenhausen, one of more than 6,300 Jewish men who would be forever changed by that experience. Fritz Ascher was released after six weeks, only to be re-arrested and incarcerated in the Potsdam Gestapo prison for five more months. Here too, six weeks are almost like a life sentence. Thanks to son Gerhard Grassmann and Protestant pastor Heinrich Grüber, Ascher was released on May 15, 1939, for the settlement of an inheritance matter and, his for, and for his alleged immigration. However, he was not allowed to board a sea voyage to Shanghai. Instead, he had to report to the local police precinct three times a week and once a month to the Gestapo headquarters at Alex uh, Alexanderplatz. He was forced to move into a Jew house, the city equivalent of a ghetto, and the only place Jews were now allowed to live. From no November 19, 1941, he had to wear the yellow star. When his name appeared on a deportation list, Asha was warned. 
he turned to Martha Grossman, who lived in the Grunewald neighborhood of Berlin, where stately mansions stood on large properties, often hidden from direct view by old trees. The neighborhood had been home to many Jewish artists, publishers, intellectuals, and politicians. But since 1933, more and more of these Jewish inhabitants had been expelled from their homes, and important NS institutions and high-ranking Nazi officials had moved in. The Grunewald train station was nearby, where the mass deportations of Berlin's Jews had begun on October 18, 1941. Here, Martha Grassmann hid Asher for three years, first in her apartment and later in the basement of the building Lassenstraße 26, which you can see here, one of the very few Grunewald villas hit by a bomb. She was under permanent surveillance and was subjected to several house searches. She recalled, I quote, he hid in a tiny space in my part of the basement. During air raids, he was locked in the superintendent's cellar. For three years, he lived in the basement among rats and wildcats. Quote end. This tiny basement space was most certainly dingy and damp, without light, a bucket instead of a toilet, and no running water to wash. Friend and collector Karl Elwanger remembered, I quote, Apparently, Mrs. Grassmann hit three men. She said that Asha always stayed in his hiding place. One day, the other two could not longer bear it, went out and never returned, quote end. Especially late in the war, when all able-bodied men were drafted into the Volk Volkssturm, it was perilous for men to be seen in the streets. The Nazis had stepped up manhunt in the streets to find Jews, deserters, or forced laborers who had escaped. In his hideout, Asher hid even more. Fear of betrayal and discovery, torture and death, hunger, immobility, and loneliness never left him. Deprived of books, conversation, or artistic work, he was completely cast back at himself and his educational horizon. He expressed his feelings in poems. Ratte, dunkel bleibt's und schleicht in Huschen. Unrat scheint dem Geist gemein. Tückisch wie die Augen funkeln. Menetekel des Versumpften, des Verfemten flüchtig sein. In other poems, he reflected on his unpainted images. He wrote about love and the divine and tributes to his artistic role models. He also turned to a new theme. Many poems evoke nature as a place of refuge and a spiritual home. After Germany's defeat in 1945, Fritz Ascher was one of about 5,000 Jews who had survived submerged in Germany. About 1,700 of them survived in Berlin. Twelve years of persecution very much altered his personality, his life, as well as his art. The artist moved in with Martha Grassmann at Bismarck 26, just a block from his former hiding place. She took care of him for the rest of his life. Former neighbor Uster, Ute Gustavus remembered, I quote, she protected him from the outside world, quote end. And the outside world was not friendly. The American Angus Surveys, that's the Office of Military Government United States, conducted between 1945 and 1949, found that the German people were even more anti-Semitic after 1945 than during the Nazi regime. Even though open anti-Semitism was suppressed by the occupying powers, it continued as a generally silent and latent force. Jews who were not able or willing to leave the country retreated into the private sphere, a so-called absent presence. Fritz Ascher began painting again. He started by repainting some of his existing works, very often covering them with a pointillism of expressive colorfulness. Ascher's Beethoven is a painted portrait bust of the composer, to which he added multicolored dots and dashes. The vibrancy of color and the quickness of the dash lines 
could indicate the array of feelings engendered by Beethoven's music or the sound of Beethoven's work. While conclusive evidence for Usher's exploration of these ideas may remain forever unknown, situating his juxtaposition of abstract form with identifiable subjects aligns his work with a broader avant-garde effort to use visual media to capture non-visual sensory states. But soon the artist completely turned away from his earlier figurative compositions. Instead, he turned to nature and painted vibrant landscapes inspired by the nearby Grunewald forest. Finally, he was able to paint the motifs he had envisioned in poems like Sonnenuntergang from 1942, written in hiding. Das güldene Ründen senkte sacht, verstrahlend, er glutete verblutend alle Ferne, bis es ergraut und schaffe dann gewand, das Nächtige geschah. The artist stayed faithful to his expressionist sensitivity and used bright colors and intense brushstrokes. He worked with renewed immediacy and urgency, dramatically simplifying forms and medium. Periods of intense work were interrupted by periods of deep despair. Karl Elwanger recalled, I quote, when he worked, he seemed to be in a trance. He was almost not there. He would walk the length of the room, adding a brush stroke and then walking back, constant back and forth, it was impossible to follow him, quote end. In works like Setting Sun, paint is running in all directions. Traces of the creative process in which the artist turned the picture until the result felt right. Like most other Jews in Germany, he lived largely withdrawn from society. He declined a teaching position. After a successful exhibition of 30 paintings at the Buchholz Gallery Berlin in May 1946, he declined every solo or group exhibition for 25 years. In 1969, only a month before he died, Legendary Berlin gallerist Rudolf Springer showed the artist's work in a large solo exhibition. In powerful images of suns, flowers, and trees, Usher engaged with his own Lebensraum. His thick, bright pigments suggest both vibrant, life-affirming joy and, in the rough nature of his brush strokes, a dark inner anguish transformed into light. Painting became the reassurance of his own existence, and the paintings became partners and confidants, even substitutes for his lost homeland, his mentally and physically demolished hometown Berlin. Usher's trees and flowers often fill out the entire picture plane. Alone or in groups, they stand like monuments in their landscapes, the sunflowers like glowing balls of sun, expressions of fertility and optimism. The Grunewald is well known for its ancient tree populations of, uh, population of pines and oaks, which outwitted many storms and seasons. In Usher's works, these old trees with massive trunks fill out the entire picture plane and often form a wall of resistance, which the viewer is not invited to permeate. Trees in a hilly landscape is Usher's last dated painting from 1968. Again, old pines fill out the entire canvas, but between the two massive, close-standing trees on the left side and an isolated tree on the right, a white landscape meets a cloudy sky in the horizon. In contrast to these massive old trees, young trees bear witness to the rapid reforestation of the Grunewald in the late 1940s. These young trees seem exposed to the elements, fragile and full of suspense in relation to nature and one another. These trees become standing figures, confronting us, each as distinctive as any individual. At the end of 1969, the Villa Bismarck Allee 26 was sold for demolition, and Fritz Ascher was forced to move. He died just three months later, on March 26, 1970. The Weimar Republic inspired a creative outpour 
especially in its capital, Berlin. Many of these artistic voices were often forever silenced by the Nazi regime. I invite you now to discover one of these voices, never lost and not forgotten anymore, in the exhibition Fritz Ascher, Expressionist. Thank you. Uh, if you have any questions for Rachel, she'll be in the exhibition to answer those. So please join us to see this incredible exhibition. And thank you for coming this evening.